This week on The Communicators, our guest is Gary Shapiro, the president and CEO of the Consumer Electronics Association. Well, we've invited Gary Shapiro, president and CEO of the Consumer Electronics Association, to be on The Communicators with us to discuss several different issues. We want to get his impressions from the recent Consumer Electronics Show held in Las Vegas. We also want to talk about some of the policy issues facing his industries. And we also want to discuss his new book, The Comeback, How Innovation Will Restore the American Dream. Gary Shapiro, if we could start with the Consumer Electronics Show, what were some of the innovative or new technology telecommunications products that were on display out in Vegas? Well, first, Peter, thanks for having me. Uh, coming back from the International CES, which really marks the beginning of the innovation or technology year for the world, it's, it's, it just gives you cause for optimism because, look, at that show we had 2,700 different companies introducing some 20,000 new products in about 1.6 million square feet of exhibit space. And with all those products out there, there was a huge, huge array of of great things. I mean, Ford used the, the opportunity, uh, the CEO, to give a speech and introduce the Ford's first ever electric car, and it only requires a three-hour charge, which is a major breakthrough. Um, that you don't think of as consumer electronics, but yet increasingly cars are consumer electronics products. The way we look at it, there's three screens. The big television screen, we saw a lot there with 3D and connection to the internet. The little screen, which is the smartphone, and there are so many developments there, but a lot of action was with that middle screen. You know, it started out as the ebook, went to the iPad, and now it's called the tablet category. Eighty new tablets were introduced at CES. Now, how quickly do the products that are introduced at CES get to the marketplace, if they make it to the marketplace at all? Well, Peter, that's a good point. The fact is, is that of those 20,000 new introductions, probably less than half of them will actually ever get to the marketplace, because a lot of them you're, you're trying to see if you could sell them to retailers. We had 7,000 press there. We wanted to see if the press would write about them or, or talk about them on blogs or television or radio. Uh, investors are being sought. It's, it really, with 140,000 people gathered in one area, it's a confluence, and there's a lot of experimenting going. But certainly a lot of the products will get to market, and they could get into market anywhere from a month or two to a year. Now, uh, one of the uh, uh, aspects of the Consumer Electronics Show is the policy aspect. And a lot of policymakers, members of Congress, uh, uh, members of the FCC are out there. What is your message? What, what is the takeaway that you want them to have? Well, the truth is we have great government guests out there, and we're so thrilled that especially the uh, people focused on technology like the FCC are out there in force. Um, the first message, believe it or not, that I want them to have is I want to help them I want our government to help us host the 30,000 international guests we have. We're the only country in the world that is a little bit arrogant towards our international visitors, and yet they're, they're making a difference. They're helping us meet our national goal of exporting, because think about it, 80% of our companies are small businesses that are showing product at their show. If they want to export, they use our show. Otherwise, they'd have to travel to shows abroad. We want to support shows like ours abroad. We're the biggest show in, of any type in the Americas, but we need our government officials to help us host. And frankly, our own ethics laws uh, prohibit most of the hosting, which is unfortunate. But what we want them to see is the, the diversity, the excitement, the innovation that we have in this industry. We are the future. We're the engine that's pulling along American jobs and the economy. There's so much going on in technology that is optimistic and positive that we want policymakers to feel it. There's two types of policymakers we see in Washington. Those that have been to our show and those that haven't. Those that have been to the show understand the dynamism of the industry, the interaction, the importance of the major issues like um, trade and innovation. And those that have not been to the show, frankly, we're just another industry to them and, and you know, part of the cacophony of Washington. I want to introduce also as well Paul Kirby, Senior Editor of Telecommunications Reports, who is joining our conversation. We'll turn it over to him in just a minute, but I want to read one sentence from your book, The Comeback. You write that national business leaders agree that industry has been hurt by the well-meaning efforts of the federal government to help the economy. Absolutely. Uh, I think Ivan Seidenberg of Verizon, as head of the Business Roundtable, gave a very seminal speech a few months ago when he said that, you know what, the challenge is our government is not exactly helping business. When you, when you use the phrase greed 
in conjunction with the word business and almost all the time and you demonize businesses has happened for the last two years it because of a few bad apples it, it sends the wrong message to the public and it's a matter of leadership and and if you have policies look we've had two unwinnable wars stimulus packages corporate bailouts um, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, cash for clunkers, first time home. We have, all we've done is spend. We have totally spent so much money and any business person knows that, you, that is totally unsustainable and the next generation is going to be, all they're going to be doing is paying interest on that debt. So you have leadership that's demonizing business and you have spending which is crippling our future and you have a major problem ahead of you and, and the business community, I think it's fair to say, is pretty concerned about that. Why is the president of the Consumer Electronics Association taking on some of the issues you just listed? Well, because frankly, our board has, has decided as a strategy saying that the only thing that matters to our future and our future health in, as an innovation ec economy is the health of the United States economy in the next five to ten years. And there's deep concern about the future of the U.S. economy in the next five to ten years because of our own government's policies. So. If that's the only thing that matters is the health of the U.S. economy and we're concerned about the actions our government is taking, that's why I'm out there and I'm visible on these issues. This isn't just one person speaking. I'm speaking on behalf of an industry. And I'm sure there are outliers in the industry who may disagree. I haven't met them yet, but I'm sure they're out there with 2,000 corporate members. But uh, I only hear support from corporate America for what, what we're saying and doing. Paul Kirby. Um, to look at a couple policy issues, the Obama administration and the FCC they want to reallocate or rather free up 500 megahertz of spectrum over the next decade. Some of that spectrum is being used by TV stations, by the Department of Defense. How difficult do you think is it going to be for them to reach their goal? Well, first of all, despite what I just said about the government doing some bad things, in this area they're doing absolutely the right thing because we need new spectrum to have wireless broadband competition. Um, the challenge we're facing today, and a lot of people are experienced, and certainly in Las Vegas at our show, is you are having dropped calls. You can't get access to the Internet in a crowded environment. In cities like New York and San Francisco, it's very difficult. That is the future that's coming for the rest of the country. So the FCC, the administration, the NTA, and Republicans, this is a bipartisan effort, have together made a decision looking at the future and said, we have a major spectrum challenge. We're having all this video using by Netflix and YouTube and all this traffic over the internet is clogging it up and just a few projections down the road show, wow, we have a serious problem. So they've taken some spectrum from the government and they're looking at spectrum from other sources including broadcasters and saying we have to repurpose the spectrum and make it available for wireless broadband competition. And that's important. It's just not one wireless broadband company. It's just not broadband. It's competition between cable, and satellite, uh, fiber, even power line companies can now provide broadband. That's all, in a sense, a lot of that is wired, but then wireless competition we need as well. And then the consumer wins, prices are lower, and there's a tremendous amount out there in terms of broadband. Now, you said at the show, um, broadcasters are squatting on America's broadband future. There's, a big, there, there's expected to be a big fight in the reallocation of, of broadcast spectrum, even though the FCC says it can be voluntary. How difficult will it be to get broadcast spectrum? Well, certainly the broadcasters are a phenomenal political lobby, and they have terrified members of Congress with their power to use their broadcast signal in a way which demonizes members of Congress. But I think everyone recognizes at this point, when broadcasters were first loaned the spectrum, and it is a loan, they do not own the spectrum, it is borrowed. They had 100% of the population covered. We had, you know, I was a kid, we had three or four channels, and that was it. Now broadcasters basically are going as a primary source in less than 10% of American homes. Americans are using cable, they're using satellite, and they're also frankly using increasingly the internet as a primary source or exclusive source of information and broadband. So when you're in fewer than 10% of American homes as a source, you have to say, is it worth it to take up all the beachfront property, all the waterfront for basically you know, one type of ship? What broadcasters have done is, you know, right now their signal on cable and satellite is much more important than their local signal. They'll still have that some way. And they've also um, preserved their future by investing with us in a, a type of technology which allows them to be received locally over the Internet. So broadcasters see the writing on the wall. And, and I think the FCC, uh, in their broadband report, which was a unanimous bipartisan report, said, you know what, we're going to give broadcasters money for this spectrum, even though they don't own it, and through what are called voluntary um, incentive spectrum auctions. So they'll be 
offered the opportunity to, to bid out, to get money for something they don't even really own. I think that's quite a deal for them. Now, how difficult will it be? The legislation introduced last year was bipartisan on set of auctions. How difficult will it be, do you think, to get that legislation through? Because this whole plan rests on, to be voluntary, rests on those incentive auctions. Otherwise, there won't be money freed up that could be given to broadcasters, and they won't agree to anything. Well, the, it is bipartisan. It will be bipartisan. I think it's a question of making it a national priority, um, leadership from the administration. Uh, there will be support behind it. It may be uh, new broadcasters, will, they, they certainly will try to get more and more as a percentage of that revenue because the government has to get a percent. And there's going to be a battle over that percentage and the broadcasters going to come out swinging and saying this is bad. But ultimately, there will be a resolution, I'm convinced, in the next two years. And what about the technical issues of it? Even if you had the legislation, there's a lot of technical issues with repacking channels and whether that will actually work. I mean, it's, a lot of it is down in the weeds, but will it technically work to to uh, make this plan happen? Look, I am very proud of how we transitioned as a nation to digital television. I was part of that for almost 20 years. I am so excited about HDTV that my tombstone is going to be in that 16 by 9 aspect ratio. I'm very proud of it. That required repackaging. That required industries getting together. That was much more complex than taking a little bit of broadcast spectrum and repurposing it for uh, wireless. Now, Gary Shapiro, in the comeback, you write, it's time to require broadcasters to return at least half of their present spectrum by 2015. Why 2015? I'm a big believer that deadlines allow action. You have to have deadlines for almost anything you do. I learned in writing a book that our deadline was a consumer electronic show and that pushed me. Meetings are, are wasted sometimes, but they're deadlines for action. Um, our DTV transition was delayed a couple of times, but the deadline was something that was very important. And that's what Senator McCain and others pushed that through. Uh, so that's why you need a deadline. It has to be sometime sooner rather than later. 2020 uh, is certainly way too late because we can't afford to be a nation without broadband internet service. We're already behind the rest of the world and by most measures of broadband. So we really need to get there. It's important for our education future, our innovation future. All these great new devices are, that are coming out there that are ready to be unleashed here. We don't want the U.S. to be the country that's second rate and behind the rest of the world. On the other side, though, is the, the efficient use of spectrum. Is it, uh, the, is it the onus on your member companies to be more efficient in their use of spectrum and how they, how they uh, develop their products? Well, certainly there's been great um, increases in what technology can do, but there are absolute bounds of physics. And while increasingly companies are doing things and there are breakthroughs that are occurring, it seems that we're pressing up against you know, how much you could cut that signal and splice it and splice it to the, almost the subatomic level and say we can't do more. So there's a, when you have Intel and Microsoft and other major U.S. companies saying this is absolutely critical to our future, I believe them. So at what point is there going to be a spectrum crisis if no action is taken? I think we're on the verge of a spectrum crisis in some uh, major U.S. cities today. I mean, the, the great excitement about the announcement of Verizon uh, with Apple was the fact that a lot of the AT&T Apple people were frustrated because the AT&T service was perceived um, as a little bit difficult in some areas of the country. So this will give a choice, and there are certainly uh, a lot more to go in that area. But the challenge is just not the services. The challenge is that we're moving to full motion video in everything we do. And if you want HDTV video over the internet and you want everyone to get it with not only YouTube but Netflix and all the other services that are about to come or are coming, we need the spectrum. This is C-SPAN's Communicators Program. Our guest is Gary Shapiro, President and CEO of the Consumer Electronics Association. Joining in our conversation, Paul Kirby, Senior Editor of Telecommunications Reports. You mentioned fewer than 10 percent of Americans get their TV from over the air. Should they, do they have a right to continue to do that? Uh, some people have said, reallocate all the TV spectrum and, and those people can move to cable or satellite. Do people have a right to over the air, free over the air TV? Well, certainly there's nothing in the United States Constitution about that. And one of our dangers as a country is people now think they have all sorts of rights that perhaps they, they really didn't have, like a right to unemployment compensation for two years, a right for health care, a right for all these things, which are nowhere in our founding documents. But the point of the comeback is we have to prioritize and say what really Americans are entitled to. No American should die from a lack of health care, certainly. But is an American going to die because they 
they don't have a free over their television signal? Hardly. This was a debate in the DTV thing. We did not support the $2 billion that the American government gave for the DTV transition because we didn't think it was a good use of money. At the time, I was saying we have bigger issues to communicate to the American public, like the fact that they're signing mortgages they shouldn't be entering. And this was four or five years ago I was saying this. Look, to me, television service is great, but you have radio, you have newspaper, you have, all, you have neighbors, you have all sorts of things. Uh, definitely there should be some type of service, it, but th when it came down to the DTV transition, it's certainly clear now in retrospect that those billions of dollars that were spent were pretty much wasted because, as I said, it was nothing. Americans didn't complain. It wasn't a big deal. There's research which shows that we can give every American free basic cable or satellite service and it would be cheaper in terms of getting the spectrum back than anything we're talking about now with giving the broadcasters money. So that over-the-air spectrum could be better used in other ways. One other issue that you address in the comeback is immigration reform. Mm -hmm. And you call for these measures to be taken by the federal government. Visas and citizenship for gifted students. Quick path for citizenship for entrepreneurs and the financially able. Create a process of granting citizenship to qualified immigrants. Don't allow entry of all relatives of all citizens. And make English our official language. How and important is immigration reform to your industries? It's very important. The one that I would really stress, which maybe is not on that list, was what we're doing in our educational system is crazy. We have the, most of the PhDs are being granted to math and science are from people from outside the U.S. We have the best universities in the country. And what we do is we educate these people, and then we kick them out when they get their degree. They should be getting a green card. Those other things we're talking about, to me, are just basic common. We have immigration problems. I'm really not getting involved with the big, great um, problem, the fact that we have illegal immigrants here. I don't even talk about that. But what I'm saying is forward thinking. Of course English should be our official language. Of course we should do some of those things. They make sense. Other countries, Canada gives anyone who's creating jobs a lot of money. We have proposals that are bipartisan proposals now that cover some of those things in Congress. We have to think smart. Around the world, when I used to go around the world, my counterparts running electronics associations and IT associations would give us a hard time. We were getting the best and the brightest from around the world. Since September 11th, 2001, that has totally changed. We've shut the door. We've almost become hostile to the best and the brightest. We need those people. Most of our, or many of our great technology companies were founded by immigrants. We're an immigrant culture. That's what makes us so great. It's the First Amendment. It's the fact that we're an immigrant culture. We have this great mosaic of people. We challenge the status quo. We have a First Amendment, which encourages innovative thinking. This is who we are. This is America's special sauce. We have to preserve that as part of our national strategy. English as the official language. Why? Because I think a country should have a common culture and a common language. It's like, what this book is, what the comic is about, is basically it's a strategic plan for the United States. I originally did the, the, the analysis that any business does, a SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Every business does this. Industry should have SWOT. We do it. We do it for our trade show, and we should certainly do it as a country, and we should agree on it. A basic element is that you have to be able to communicate. Let's face it, the immigrants who came here, our forefathers that came here, they learn English. Uh, all the immigrants, I'm married to an immigrant, my in-laws are immigrants. They learn English. Now look, my wife is teaching my, insisting my child learn Polish and Chinese. So my two and a half year old speaks three languages to this point. I don't understand two thirds of what's going on in my family. But I respect that. It's not only um, good to learn languages because it helps you communicate. It also gets your brain differently. The rest of the world is learning different languages. Americans should too, but we need one basic language and I think that's English. Paul Kirby. Another global issue, you said at CES that the U.S. had not finalized a free trade agreement in four years while other countries were signing agreements. Why do you think this is the case and, and what needs to be done to kind of spur U.S. policymakers? One of the most dangerous things that I see is the arrogance of America. We're separating ourselves from the world. The rest of the world, Canada, South America, Europe, Asia, are furiously entering free trade agreements. They're cutting down tariffs. The president correctly wants to double exports. Well, to do that, we can't pay more than other countries to export our products. And so instead, we're isolating ourselves. You asked why we haven't in the last four years? For four years, we've had a Speaker of the House of Representatives that was far left, and the unions were very much in sync with it. And the unions in the United States incorrectly are hurting our country by basically saying, Democrats, you may not pass free trade agreements. It's horrible, it's destructive, and it's wrong, and it's just killing our economy. An another issue, a policy issue, that also involves broadcasters. Um, uh, 
The question is, should Congress pass legislation that would mandate cell phones have FM chips in it? NAB is pushing for that. Uh, your association, CTIA, and some other tech groups say no. Why do you think that's a bad idea? And politically, are you going to be able to fight back NAB on that? Well, this is a battle we stayed out of and we were brought into. This is a battle between radio stations who want to play music without paying um, and the broadcasters. And the music industry says, you must pay. Everybody else pays. And, and there's arguments on both sides. The broadcasters were a little bit clever. They, they wanted to block legislation, so they brought us in. They said, we'll agree to pay, provided that you agree to require an FM chip be added to every cell phone sold, every smartphone. And we said, wait a second, that's absurd. Why would you load down new technology with old technology? That's like requiring a horse be put in front of every car when a car was introduced over 100 years ago. You don't, that's a very bad policy. There is no support in Congress for that. But there is, I think, support because I think the music industry is right. Broadcasters should pay. And the way to do that, and the way I think this will ultimately come down, is for all new music after a certain date, broadcasters will have to have permission to play it. And that means, and, and or they could be paid to play it. So broadcasters can make more revenue, radio broadcasters. And certainly if musicians don't want their work played, they have the right to say don't. And that really unveils the broadcaster argument that radio is a great promotional vehicle for music. Gary Shapiro, I want to return for just a second to international issues. It, it, it doesn't telecommunications technology basically erase geographical borders? You know, that's a great point. And in, in, in reading the book, I've gotten great responses. It's doing really well on Amazon and Barnes and & Noble. But my son, uh, oh, I have an older son in his 20s, and he said, Dad, your books are relevant. You're so focused on the United States. Um, the Internet has made it so it really doesn't matter. I disagree. I think the countries and geography uh, still has a purpose. I think America has, is the best country in the world. I'm, I believe in American exceptionalism. We have such great things here. We have a history of democracy and creativity and entrepreneurship, and we let companies and people fail. So there's still a geographic purpose. Now, certainly the Internet has made it difficult to regulate. Look, even Europe, they have different concepts of privacy than we have, and some of that hurts them. Why is it the America has all the best Internet companies in the world? Why are we the most creative with our motion picture industry? We have a, a sense of culture and of challenge and of experimentation and a system of laws and a genetically great uh, innovative culture that has allowed us to succeed. I want to preserve that, and I believe we're sending kids to Iraq and Afghanistan. Our parents in World War II, we have to honor them. We have to fight to preserve our country and its future. And that's what the comeback is about. And that's why I'm passionate about it. Is there a Consumer Electronics Association for the uh, for the EU or for Japan, China, Brazil, et cetera? And there are. What's your cooperation? Absolutely. Level? Our tech, there's, I have technology counterparts from the world. I just spent last week hosting them and meeting with 26 different associations from around the world. We share a common view of the importance of free trade. Um, and, and a lot of other areas, there are other big issues that are coming. But of course, we're competitive in the ways that we want each of our, our organization only has U.S. companies or companies with, that are a subsidiary of a foreign company. We each have our way of competing and we, you know, everyone believes in their own country. This is what you write in the comeback about broadband. It's so disappointing that the U.S. continues to fall behind other countries on virtually every important measure of broadband availability and quality it didn't have to be that way. Why is it that way in your view? Well, because we really haven't focused on broadband as we should. We, haven't, we don't have enough competition. We haven't freed up enough spectrum out there. We've made it, in, in part, we've made it a little bit difficult for the telephone companies and, and, and others to compete. I, the cable industry has been the best at broadband. They were very strategic as an industry. They said, we're, we're in a sense, losing our entertainment audience to other media, and we're going to go after broadband as a revenue source, and they were brilliant about it. I think we have to foster that competition between different providers of broadband and wireless. Um, so I want to look forward. I don't want to look backward, but by measures of broadband, we're clearly not doing as well as we should. Should not the uh, cable companies, if they were brilliant and, and forward-thinking, be rewarded for that uh, brilliance and forward-thinkingness? I think they are rewarded in, in a sense that they, they are competing for customers with others, and they have a, they get, I believe, more revenue from broadband than they do from other services, or, or it's definitely growing. Um, certainly, uh, I have broadband through a cable service. I'm paying for that. It's, it's something which is it's, it's a good pipe to the home. There's a lot of good arguments for it. You talk about new technologies, the importance of new technologies. Broadcasters would say, well, we're going to do mobile TV. We're going to have these mobile devices. What's your reaction to their argument that 
guess what? We're going to use our spectrum for not just over-the-air TV. We're going to use it for this other stuff. You know, that's possible. Mobile, mobile TV is a technology which is out there waiting to uh, see, see what happens with it. Certainly Qualcomm uh, tried it, and it didn't work. It, it has worked in other cultures where people are more used to watching TV on the go. In a lot of ways, what has become popular is Internet on the go, um, and so we'll see. Um, certainly, if broadcasters really get behind it, which they haven't, and really promote it, it could make a difference. I don't think you need all the spectrum for that. I think that's a matter of slicing and dicing the spectrum, which I think we're perfectly capable of doing. Mm -hmm. Gary Shapiro, there seems to be a brewing uh, brouhaha over net management, net uh, network management between the House Republicans and the FCC. What's your view on that? Well, there's no question that from an entrepreneurial point of view, what, what's making us great is that anyone could start an internet service and it could be carried and they could make a fortune. And we do house every major um, internet company started in the United States and it was because they were carried by everyone. At the same time, there's really no history of discrimination against, uh, against these things. So nothing bad has really happened yet. And that's what part of the disagreement is between the Republicans and Democrats. But my view is if we have competition and if we get this spectrum and we have all sorts of different, if you have as a consumer, an American consumer, five different choices of broadband, the net neutrality fades away as an issue. If you can get out of your contract and you know the terms, I shouldn't say get out of your contract. If you know what the terms are and you could switch if the terms change to someone else, the net neutrality doesn't really matter that much as an issue when you look down five to ten years. And to me, net neutrality is an issue which Washington loves. Lobbyists on both sides that are not working for companies or associations directly. I think people who get advertising love it. It was the most lobbied, money spent issue in Washington for the last four years except for perhaps health care. And to me, it's not the issue of the day it should be. The FCC did kind of a compromise thing, which is almost a Democrat-Republican compromise. And certainly the Republicans are looking for a reason to call the FCC on it. I want to move past. I want to move to the future, and the future is spectrum. Speaking of spectrum, another nice spectrum block is called the D block, which public safety wants. Does, does your association have a view on whether that should be re-auctioned to provide that spectrum uh, to companies out there? Well, certainly our view, there's a balance between essentially three types of spectrum, and everyone has to get a little bit. The public safety community, what's more important than that? I mean, they have a compelling case to make, and we want to see it happen. And I'm not an expert as to how it should happen, but they deserve to be listened to, and they deserve spectrum. We all want them to be able to communicate and have basic emergency needs thought. The second is the license spectrum, where it's bid on, everyone gets money. But there's a third called unlicensed spectrum, and a lot of innovation occurs there. Uh, we first pushed for that years ago, and it started out with garage door openers, but now there's all sorts of technologies out there which use unlicensed. And unlicensed means no one pays for it, and you have to abide by certain rules of not interfering with others and being a good neighbor and things like that. And it allows great and tremendous innovations that I can't even think of, but other entrepreneurs do, and there's a lot of opportunity there. So three types of it, you know, all spectrum is essentially the same, except it has different characteristics. But in terms of how you allocate that beachfront property, um, there should be a, some for each of those three groups. But specifically, does CEA have a position on what should occur with the D block? No. Okay. And then, as far as spectrum, you talk about unlicensed. Something else that the FCC has done is the TV white spaces, and a lot of your members have really pushed for that to be opened up, which it's going to be for unlicensed devices. So that is some of the innovation I assume you're talking about for for broadband and. Oh, definitely. Yeah. You know, the FCC is almost done, uh, and that was a tricky thing for the FCC to do, to deal with the, the spaces between the television signals, the so-called white spaces, mm -hmm. um, and, and, and deal with some of the people who are already using that in one fashion or another, the, you know, the, the wireless microphone people versus mm -hmm. others. Uh, but definitely, there's, you know, Microsoft, Intel, and others are just waiting for that final decision, and we expect the FCC to do that shortly. Gary Shapiro, uh, back to the Consumer Electronics Show and uh, policymakers. Coming out of this show, coming out of all this technology, again, what would you like policymakers to know about your industry and how would you like them to react here in Washington? Well, I think policymakers understand as they go out to the CES, and this is Democrats and Republicans, 
that basically innovation is pulling the U.S. economy along, and there's a phenomenal amount of innovation out there. There's great reasons for optimism. It's tough to walk that shelf floor and not be optimistic about our future as a country, as a society, as an industry. And you recognize that government isn't the one that necessarily creates the jobs, but government has to make sure that entrepreneurs can start because we run that show for the smallest company, a guy in his garage, to come up with an idea and expose it to others, and we keep it cheap for them because that's every big company starts as a small company. And the big company executives will even say they want to see the small entrepreneurs there. So we want the, the policymakers to go there and be excited. We want the U.S. policymakers to understand that free trade is important. Look, Apple makes products uh, in China. But the innovation ideas come from here. There's only about $4 worth of the assembly in China, but a lot of it's, and that's what the Chinese don't like. They complain about it. So free trade is very important. Having a skilled workforce is important. Attracting the best and the brightest. And focusing on good uses of spectrum. And thinking about our future as a nation. Also, I think they have to recognize that the most significant companies in the world in technology are, are really, a lot of them are based here. And that as a U.S. strategy, we shouldn't be going after them because that's catnip to the rest of the world. When I travel around the rest of the world, they want to attack those companies. Some want to emulate the U.S. and they're envious, but boy, you go there and they talk about closed systems and antitrust things and, and violent blocking mer mergers and privacy. They're just going after Google and Intel and Qualcomm and Microsoft, and they're going after our best companies, and we have to be aware of that. And in fact, you write in the comeback, make no mistake, I'm not opposed to copyrights or patents. But I agree with Thomas Jefferson's denunciation of what he called the monopolies of invention, which is the jealous guarding of an innovation at the expense of further progress. Well, that's a, that's a very fruitful area to talk about because that's what's talking about is you have intellectual property, which is protected patents and copyrights and trademarks. And you know, originally when we started out, patents and copyrights were the same amount of time, less than 20 years. Now, copyrights expanded, so it's almost forever. It's over 100 years. And the penalties have gotten so high that for a company to innovate, it could be subject to billions of dollars worth of damage if you break this unknown copyright law and somehow you infringe because it allows some type of copy. We have to be very careful. We have, to, we have the best copyright industries in the United States, and we have to protect them from commercial piracy. What we have to change is this lengthy term and these huge, huge damages, $250,000 a day times five years times per copy that basically could bankrupt, copies, bankrupt companies if somehow they go over an unknown line in terms of their innovation. Gary Shapiro is the president and CEO of the Consumer Electronics Association. Paul Kirby is the senior editor of Telecommunications Reports. And this is Gary Shapiro's new book, The Comeback, How Innovation Will Restore the American Dream, forward by Dallas Mavericks owner Mark Cuban. Thank you for being on The Communicators, gentlemen. Thank you very much.